Okay. Uh, let's summarize live high, train low, and um, add one twist. Previously, we've seen there were genetic limits and how uh, HIF-1, hypoxia-inducible factor, was activated. And that might explain why some people respond to altitude and some people don't. And it's fairly clear there are still there's still variation in the response and the uh, the conclusiveness of, for instance, the live high, train high effect might be due to some genetic limits. So hemoglobin changes and performance are somewhat equivocal. Hemoglobin doesn't or going up doesn't necessarily mean that performance will also go up. We saw that in the, the swimming study. Um, hemoglobin went up in the Levine Stray Gunderson study that we just looked at in the high low group and performance did go up. So somewhat equivocal. The high high group performance didn't increase. So hemoglobin and performance relationship is somewhat equivocal, but Hemoglobin and VO2 relationship is generally pretty well defined. It's pretty strong. And that's because the ability to carry oxygen and load the blood with oxygen is one of the mechanisms by which we think there is a VO2 max. It's one of the bottlenecks for VO2. So there's a very strong link between hemoglobin and VO2 max. And what we're looking at is changes in hemoglobin and changes in VO2 max after a live high train low protocol. So this isn't necessarily baseline data or endpoint data. This is change in hemoglobin and change in VO2 max from a different group. But uh, this fellow Lundby is, works really closely with Levine in, uh, in Texas. So strong relationship between if we see an increase in hemoglobin we see an increase in VO2 max. I'm not making comments of performance here because that's somewhat equivocal. What's really interesting to note is like there were differences in how HIF-1 was activated, there's a wide range of the potential to induce hemoglobin. There's a wide range of potential to increase hemoglobin with altitude exposure. And what I mean by that is if you look at the individuals as they come into the study and then monitor their changes over time, the increase in hemoglobin seems to be related to their starting point. If you have very little hemoglobin to start with, the increases are generally large. If you have a lot of hemoglobin to start with, the increases with altitude are generally small. And this is a fairly striking relationship. It's even less linear than it would be if we didn't have this one outlier up here that really responded to altitude. But that's still a pretty striking linear relationship. So if you have a lower hemoglobin to start, maybe you are someone that will naturally respond better to altitude. See a massive induction of hemoglobin and maybe a coinciding improvement in VO2 max and performance. So maybe this is more of a, it's not a stimulatory effect, not an improvement of altitude. Maybe this is normalizing hemoglobin and red cell volume in the blood. It's kind of like, um, like creatine. When we first studied, uh, studied creatine in the sport nutrition sort of field, it worked for some people. There were responders and there were non-responders. And we figured out over time that it really depends on how much is in the muscle initially. There's an upper level of how much creatine you can put into a muscle cell. And so if you had a lot naturally, you couldn't force more in, supplementation didn't work for you. Here, maybe this is something similar, a normalizing effect where we end up close to um, a similar hemoglobin at the end of the study and we have larger changes in those individuals that have low hemoglobin to start. Something like this could be simply explained by the stress of altitude. If you have a low hemoglobin initially, moving to 2,000 meters is going to hurt. 
you're going to have a hard time loading the blood and carrying oxygen. And so that stimulus to adapt is large. If you have a high hemoglobin, the opposite is true. It's going to be a stress, but you can still bind oxygen to hemoglobin. You have a fairly large complement around to carry it within the body. It's possible this could account for some of the variability and might be a measurement to include in um, future assessments. But overall, we have a really nice picture from that one study, which has been backed up and corroborated by a number of studies since, that live high, train low seems to improve hemoglobin and VO2 max similarly to a live high, train high protocol. But there's a greater, what we might call, training impulse in live high, train low. Because individuals training at a higher PO2, moving back down to altitude, will work naturally at a higher workload. And the impulse for the training adaptation would be greater. Whatever the result, live high, train low was the only group that saw an improvement in 5K performance, which is the ultimate goal of this type of paradigm or this type of stress. It's not to improve VO2 max is not to increase hemoglobin content. The ultimate goal, improve performance. Live high, train low is the only group that really saw that improvement in performance. We still see that variability, and we're starting to think, or, or the way that we can explain that variability might be in differences in baseline hemoglobin on top of what we mentioned before, differences in activating HIF-1. It's possible some people are just set up to respond to altitude better than others, and there's not one prescription for everybody. Despite that, I'm going to tell you the prescription for everybody coming up. So changes are variable, related to baseline hemoglobin. Maybe some people are just altitude responders. Maybe. Now, picking up on this idea, the, the whole um, the foundation of this idea is that you can exercise harder while stimulating altitude adaptations. Just moving to altitude doesn't allow that. You can't exercise harder while stimulating altitude adaptations. Live high, train low allows you to do that. So I wonder if we were just able to train harder without moving to altitude, could that also show similar improvements in performance, uh, similar improvements in hemoglobin, et cetera, outside of the altitude stimulus? And an interesting way to approach that is not in applying hypoxia or moving to altitude from your sea level baseline. You don't want to make a low PO2 environment in your new baseline and then adapt to it. Applying hyperoxia, in a sense, says make sea level altitude. If you breathe in hyperoxic gas during exercise, does that deliver more oxygen? Does that allow you to exercise harder? Does that cause you to train at a higher level? So. If we enhance O2 delivery during exercise, if we do that acutely, we can see measurable improvements in VO2 max just on a one-off acute basis. If you breathe hyperoxic gas and do a VO2 max test, VO2 max goes up. I'm not looking at that here. I'm looking at training. But um, if we do that regularly, could we improve workload? And would that increased workload make for a greater stress and then underscore a greater training adaptation. Right? Training is whatever stress you can place on the body. This asks, can we make the stress greater by using hyperoxic gas <clears throat> while training at sea level? And initially, this area was really promising. This was... Uh, a study that was published from my old PhD lab right as I started my PhD. And this fellow, uh, Chris Perry, is still one of my really good friends, working at uh, York University right now in, uh, in Ontario. Um, 
really fantastic guy, great researcher. He's moved away from this, this uh, work a little bit, but this was one of his first studies during his master's, looking to see whether hyperoxic uh, breathing at sea level can enhance the training stimulus. So this is time to exhaustion data after six weeks of training, either just in room air or with hyperoxic gas. And Chris went through fantastic lengths to blind the individuals in the study. First, it's a crossover study. So these individuals trained for six weeks. They washed out over the Christmas break, didn't do anything, and then they switched groups. So you've got internal control, best case scenario, um, or gold standard for randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study. Placebo-controlled. He had a little curtain set up behind the subjects with a giant bag that he would either fill with hyperoxid gas or just room air. And he ran a, a hair dryer while he was filling the tank up so they wouldn't know if uh, the tank was on, the bag was filling, completely oblivious to which condition they're in. So really well-controlled study. And his first, um, his first look was just that whole body performance, time to exhaustion goes up with training. Sure, you're training. Goes up twice as much with hyperoxic gas. Wow, that's really impressive. And the training workloads, consistently higher. Six weeks of training, this is voluntary workload. Everyone in the hyperoxic group chose to work at a higher workload. This is on a bike, so they're pedaling faster or pedaling against a higher resistance. Every single week, hyperoxic group trained at a higher workload, and we see almost double the improvement in time to exhaustion. That's impressive. That's a massive change. So, one other thing to add is um, the type of training he's doing is, is high intensity interval training. This is on the cusp of when that training started to become really popular and now everyone's sick of it. But it was uh, four minutes at 90% of your VO2 max with two minutes off. So, hyperoxic, higher workload, blinded, crossover, and a really intense exercise. That's an important point that we're going to come back to. It's a really intense exercise. So big improvements because of the intense exercise and even bigger improvements because of the hyperoxic gas. So Chris published this and was set. He wanted to figure out why does this happen. This first study doesn't do anything to look at what's going on in the muscle or blood dynamics. So defended his PhD, came back and started, or sorry, defended his master's, came back to do a PhD. And the first study he wanted to do was, why does this happen? I want to take <coughs> muscle biopsies and blood samples. And I'm going to look at the muscle and see, okay, what explains this change with six weeks of training? Got through six weeks. And this is his main result. Time to exhaustion goes up with training. Similarly in both groups. Same study design, same guy running the study, same exercise paradigm, 90% um, for four minutes, two minutes off, six weeks. He did the same blinding. He had the bag with the hair dryer, and I was on hand for some of these. I got to help him with them. Similar change in time to exhaustion <clears throat> with hyperoxic gas. And this is despite observing the exact same trend for the training workload as in his first study. So something's wrong. Something is, is, is going on. Where he saw 100% improvement in time to exhaustion with hyperoxia initially, now there's nothing. The workload suggests there might be something there, but the overall performance effect is gone. So he's got his muscle biopsies, He's looking for differences. And I took a little blurb from the study that we'll read through real quick. Um, the findings did not confirm a previous report, and it's funny because he's talking about his report, of larger improvements in high-intensity exercise performance following hyperoxic training compared with normoxic training. It is difficult to reconcile the results of the two studies since both incorporated 
similar methodologies, and not even similar, but identical methodologies. Same lab, same investigator, same, same room, same bike, same everything. He still to this day doesn't have a, a really convincing explanation looking at things in the muscle. This is citrate synthase, which is part of the TCA cycle. Um, beta hydroxyase coa dehydrogenase, which is part of fat metabolism. Uh, aspartate aminotransferase, part of the electron shuttle system in the mitochondria. Doesn't matter what they all are, they all change similarly in hyperoxia and in normoxia. They both go up with training with no difference between groups. Or they all go up with training with no difference between groups. Nothing in the muscle could explain why there's no change in performance. We don't have this information to compare to in the first study, but pretty lukewarm results at this point. The, um, the explanation that he has was that in the first study, we used college-age men and women, really recreational people, not very fit, and they're going from sitting on a couch to a blast in the face of exercise. This massive, intense protocol is a ton of work. And so maybe in the face of that stress, hyperoxia doesn't add much. Maybe there's a benefit but maybe it is just blown out of the water by the stress of training so intensely. And so maybe it's not possible to capture any small benefit because it's lost in the noise of the adaptation to the exercise program itself. So he proposed doing this again with really elite athletes. Maybe they've already adapted and it's not so stressful and then the small variation with hypoxia or hyperoxia would come out. Um, but he never got around to it and has since lost interest. So we don't have an answer, but kind of shows, highlights that things can go completely wrong in science and you can navigate your way through. Similar methodologies. So we know that it improves acute performance. I didn't show you those results, but if you breathe hyperoxic gas, you can better maintain workload, you can improve VO2 max, acute performance is up, but there's no conclusive evidence that training with hyperoxia does much, if anything. The existing control was fairly intense in that one comparison, so we don't have a conclusive answer, but it's not, it's, it, it's not something that seems, there's no rationale to believe that there would be an effect. Its, it's uh, utility might be greatest at altitude. In a situation like live high, train high, where you're not really convinced that this is the type of paradigm that will give the best benefits, maybe if you live high, train with hyperoxia, you essentially create a surrogate low altitude or sea level altitude and so maybe it allows you to stay in the mountains, stay at training camp, and bring sea level up to you instead of you moving down like we've been talking about for the entire section. What's not really touched on that does need to be uh, considered is that it's actually pretty, not dangerous, it can be detrimental long term to breathe hyperoxic gas. So Chris used 60% O2 in his study, which is high. Right now we're breathing 20% O2, so three times the concentration of gas in the air. Um, breathing 60% or 100% O2 makes it easy to make free radicals, or reactive oxygen species. And these tend to wreak havoc in the body, disrupting normal protein function, breaking apart membranes, there are signals that the mitochondria use. It can cause cells to die if they're in too large a quantity. And you make a lot of them when you breathe in hyperoxic gas. And so the classic uh, conflict is, okay, well, is it worth trying to bring sea level up to you at altitude for the potential downside of whatever these health effects are? We don't really know. We know it happens. 
but no one's really wanted to study the long-term effects of uh, prolonged or increased ROS generation. So that's a caveat to take into account with this type of training. Improved acute performance, no consensus on training. There's some downsides, so it's not as desirable as we might have originally thought. But with the success of live high, train low, we can develop a recipe. We do have a sense of what works for how long in athletes. What are the practical considerations for altitude training? If you wanted the best bang for your buck, the greatest improvement, how would you train? And incidentally, this is the kind of setup that we would, uh, we would get going over in the lab. Big giant bag in the back. You've got two individuals breathing from the bag. So in from this closed system, uh, out into the room, and this is a hyperoxic low O2 gas, and they are dying in this situation. So optimal altitude for adaptation, about 2,000 meters. 2,000, 2,500 meters, what we would call moderate altitude. Um, this study by Chapman is out of the same lab as uh, Ben Levine. So the, uh, the initial study comparing live high, train low, live high, train high. This is a follow-up study looking at different altitudes 1,700 meters, 2,000, 2,500. 2,000 to 2,500 seems to be the sweet spot. There is technically an improvement at 2,000, but it looks like there's more of a convergence than anything. Far and away, universal improvement at 2,500-ish meters. That seems to be the uh, optimal altitude. If you look at the not only the change in uh, VO2 max, which we're showing at the top, but the change in performance. 2,400 meters, 2,500 meters shows the biggest change in performance. This is immediately post altitude, and it seems to hold out for two weeks after the exposure as well, which we'll come back to again. And this is in the face of similar red cell improvements in all groups. So really important to start trying to tease out performance effects versus physiological effects. All groups show improvements in the red cell volume or hematocrit. They all go up similarly. And 2,500 isn't even the largest improvement. It's the biggest improvement of performance. It's the biggest improvement of VO2 max. And whatever the improvement in red cell volume is, we'll just say it's enough. 2,500 meters seems to be ideal. How long do we spend at altitude? Three, four weeks. This is a, a combination, again, similar authors. You've seen these names come up a lot. Pulling data from a number of different studies and trying to do a time course. How long do you need to stay at altitude? There are control, one week, three weeks, four weeks, etc. Seems like three to four weeks with the biggest, the most noticeable, noticeable jump being at that four week mark. Four weeks, 2,500 meters seems to be um, the start of our prescription. Going along with how long at altitude, we kind of want to know how long it takes to transition. I'm not going to have time to finish these, am I? Yeah, you know what? I'm not going to be able to get through this in the last minute. Let's, um, we know most of our prescription. We know four weeks, 2,500 meters. I'm going to give you transition and then the uh, longevity data at the start of Thursday's class. We'll jump into um, doing some diving information. I'll post those slides on Moodle and then set the stage for you to take it away next week with your group presentations. Any questions before we go? No? Okay, fantastic. Have a great Tuesday. And see you on Thursday.